Let's talk a little bit about this wild and crazy thing called dark matter. Um, dark matter came into public conscious, consciousness maybe only about 20 years ago. Astronomers have known about it for a lot longer than that, but it was in the in the realm of not being considered terribly serious or there was not a lot of evidence to indicate that it really existed. One of the most key scientists to talk about dark matter was the astronomer, the great astronomer, uh, Dr. Vera Rubin. Um, Vera Rubin, I had the privilege of, I almost had the privilege of meeting, um, but this was very late in her life. I was going to a conference where she was going to speak and she was just too ill um, to attend. And so she passed away a few years back. She got a degree in astronomy from Vassar College, which was a woman's college on the East Coast. She wanted to go to Princeton, and she was not allowed in the graduate program at that point in time because women weren't, weren't allowed. And why do I mention things like that? Sometimes people forget that the world has changed in the last hundred years. So that nowadays, if you would say, well, you're female, you can't attend someplace. Um, yeah, no, that would not fly. She eventually ended up at Cornell and Georgetown working on her PhD. And with Kent Ford, her, her research partner, they did a lot of work on galaxy clusters. And in the 70s, she started studying rotation rates of galaxies, thinking that this was a lot less controversial than galaxy clusters, which was very controversial. Well, here's what Vera Rubin found, or that's what we're leading towards. Um, what she was working on is this galaxy rotation curves. What do I mean by that? If you take any point around a galaxy and you measure how fast it's going at that point, and that's pretty easy to do. Um, you find something and then you find its speed later and you find its speed later, or by looking at its Doppler shift in that direction, you can determine its speed of rotation. And then you measure its radius from the galactic center outward. If you take those two pieces of data, distance from the center and then speed going around in circles, you can make a graph which is called a speed and radius curve. Now, why did anybody care? Well, the reason people cared is if you know speed and radius and doing some math that most college physics students can do and using Kepler's third law and Newton's law of gravity, it is possible to calculate the mass that is within a certain radius. So you pick any radius within a galaxy and if you know distance and speed, you can find the amount of mass in there, the amount of mass in there, the amount of mass in there. Now, what we are used to is the things that are predicted by Newton's gravity and, New and Kepler's third law. Kepler's third law says that um, this third law and law of equal areas says that objects are going to move very, very fast when they are close and they are going to move very, very slowly when they are far away in some sort of an orbital situation like this. This is what we see with our planets. Mercury goes zippity doo on around the sun really, really fast. Good old Pluto, Uranus, Neptune way out here, they're kind of slow movers. They do not take an awful lot of time. Um, excuse me, they do take an awful lot of time to orbit the sun. So everything we know about physics has told us that near the center, things should move fast, and near the outside edges, things should move slowly. Well, Vera Rubin said by studying that for galaxies, this should be non-controversial because everybody knew what was going to happen. The things in the center would be fast and the things on the outside edge would be slow. But that's not what she found. Here's what she found. She found that as you went further and further and further and further from the center of the galaxy, each section had exactly the same speed, the same rotational speed. Now, that's nutty. Um, that is not what the laws of physics tell us should happen in galaxies. What she found on a speed ver versus distance or radius curve was instead of it getting slower and slower and slower as you went outward, she found that near the center, the speed went up to some sort of a steady rate 
and then the speed of those galaxies stayed pretty much steady for the entire width of the galaxy. And we're talking widths of galaxies. We're talking 40, 50 light years across. Huge structures. This does not make sense. Doesn't make sense and didn't make sense to the physicists. So what could explain that? The only way that you can explain this extra rotation of the galaxies is to say that there was more mass in the galaxy than anybody was aware of. There had to be extra mass. The problem was this extra mass cannot be seen. It was dark, meaning it didn't pr produce any light, and we really can't see it. It emitted no electromagnetic waves, no light waves, no radio waves, and all of a sudden there was something in the universe that we did not know about, and this stuff is called dark matter. Now, Vera Rubin was not the first one to propose this. The idea was first proposed back in the 1920s. After her work got published in the 1980s, people started going, huh, I wonder what's going on. And by the world, by the 2000s, in the last 20 or so years, it is now something that is moderately accepted. This is the way it is, and there is dark matter out there. So a couple more other pieces of this history. Um, Jakob Keptian, uh, the Dutch astronomer, proposed something like this way back in the 1920s. John Oort, Jan Oort, the Dutch astronomer who discovered the Oort cloud, he proposed that most of the mass of galaxies must be larger than we currently observed. One of the huge contributors to this dark matter idea was Fred, commonly known as Fritz Zwicky. Um, and Fritz Zwicky is one of my favorite people in astronomy because you can tell from this picture, he was a character, definitely a character. In the 1930s, Horace Babcock measured some rotation rates of Andromeda, and it didn't turn out as expected. But it wasn't until the 60s and 70s with Vera Rubin's rotation curves and more modern instrumentation that people started taking this seriously. Um, we'll talk about gravitational lensing and its proof for dark matter. The COBE background explorer, we'll talk more about that as the semester unfolds. And then the W map and how these have all led to our understanding of dark matter. So I think we're going to end this show here and we're going to come back next time and start talking about properties of dark matter.